views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us. And if you're watching, yes, Social Justice Forums is an opportunity to bring you a deeper discussion into some of the prevalent issues that are facing our community talking about understanding issues that many equalities that exist uh, in our communities. We're going to be talking about inequality. And then also we're going to hear from multiple points of view. And then we're also going to be trying to promote some civic engagement, how you can be involved, how you can stay connected. So stay with us. We've got a very special show talking about the community, talking about police, and talking about things that matter to you. The Social Justice Forum starts now. Well, many businesses are not able to reopen their doors during the COVID-19 pandemic. Even before COVID-19, many businesses were really struggling to just simply stay afloat. And those businesses are struggling due to the failure of reviving financial assistance, as well as producing enough money to pay their rent. The question is, how are things faring here in the Bronx? And in the Bronx, the small businesses are primarily African-American, Hispanic, or immigrant-owned. As New York City prepares to restart the economy, businesses are asking some questions, wondering whether or not they're capable to actually reopen their doors and then also resume services. And so joining us to provide their point of view on the matter, I'm joined by the president of the Bronx Chamber of Commerce, Lisa Soren, and the executive director of the Third Avenue Bid, uh, Michael Brady, right in the borough of the Bronx, the heart of uh, the Bronx. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thanks. So, you know, when, when we talk about this word social justice, right, a part of social justice deals with economic justice and economic injustice. And so I know for the both of you, you guys have been front and center in dealing with the issue of economic injustice, particularly as it deals with small businesses. And as I said in the lead, uh, Lisa, when we talk about small businesses, of course, the lifeblood of the Bronx, the lifeblood of America, but give us an estimation as to how small businesses have been impacted through this COVID-19 pandemic here in, in the Bronx? Well, I, I have to tell you that they have fared horribly. Unfortunately, you know, they, as you pointed out, they were already struggling to begin with. The regulations, bills, legislation that have been coming across for the last two years had already started building towards the economic hardship. COVID-19 hit there were a lot of small businesses. And when we say small businesses, we're really addressing micro businesses, anything under 10 employees, 20, which make up the majority. I almost want to say it makes up about 80, 85, if not higher percent of the businesses in our borough. So closing made it horrible. And then you have the insurances that weren't being covered and the amount of information being released on a daily basis, state, federal, a lot of businesses, one, didn't understand it, two, try to access it with no um, success. And now you're starting to reopen, but the debt is there. We've had people who applied for the Federal CARES Act, the PPP, and actually returned the money because they did not understand the rules and regulations. And those who didn't apply, didn't know about it, believe it or not. As much as people are saying, are you kidding me? It's been all, all over the place. You really have to have targeted um, access and targeted reach to be able to get to these very small businesses. And what we have found is that the technical divide is larger than we ever expected. Yeah, yeah the, the technical divide is huge. That big digital divide has been a big problem uh, just for residents, then we talk about businesses and business owners, uh, a big problem. Michael, I'll bring you in now and talk a little bit about uh, race, right? I talked at the beginning of the segment about many of the businesses impacted, uh, African-American, Hispanic, immigrant. Um, and so in a place like Third Avenue, which is for many who may not be from, you know, the city or not or from the Bronx, who knows, Third Avenue is a, a huge, diverse, multicultural place that is filled with a lot of minorities and at the same time, a lot of minority businesses. Um, 
is there a concern that as you open your doors and we reopen, um, the Third Avenue will look pretty vacant? Yeah, I, I, I think that you hit the nail right, right on the head. Um, I think that, you know, Third Avenue, like many of our commercial districts, are going to be facing some, some pretty drastic challenges, uh, not only with bringing businesses back, but with understanding the new landscape of what is retail. You know, we've, we've always, our, our bread and butter as a commercial district has always been our ground floor retail. And that's been challenged and threatened by the rise of e-commerce and big box retail. Uh, but now we have COVID-19, uh, which, which is, is threatening those businesses that have been able to hold, hold on. And I think, you know, it's, it's really important when we take a look at race that, you know, we, we do a deep dive into the Bronx. And, you know, the Bronx has seen 20 years of unprecedented growth, you know, reductions in unemployment, uh, increase in GDP, all of these really milestone attributes. However, you know, I, I think the question is, you know, those advances have not touched everyone and they've left large swaths of our community out of the loop. And not everyone has benefit, benefited from that. And a lot of those people who have not benefited are our businesses owned by people of color and women. So I think when we take, take a look at this, we have to really do a deep reflection on what can we do to systems and, structure, and structures to ensure that folks are getting their fair share and that businesses are better positioned to grow, even though times are challenging. I think we all have to just look at the reality and, and say times are challenging and they're going to be a lot challenging for at least the next two years. Um, but what can we do to assist those businesses and push them towards a more equitable resource path? Yeah. Lisa, uh, jump in with me and share about uh, minorities in business. We know that there's the MWBE, uh, and that deals with minorities and women in businesses. Uh, and I want you to give for our viewers a little bit of an understanding about MWBE. But I know there's a great concern because there's supposed to be what's called when contracts are out there, MWBE utilization goals. Um, and many times those aren't met. So what are you finding by way of MWBE and how effective has it been uh, in the borough? And then also uh, talk to me a little bit about those utilization rates and uh, kind of familiarize our viewers a little bit. Absolutely. So the certification really relies on being minority owned and or women owned. And here at the chamber, we certify over the course of the last year, we've probably certified about 20, 25 businesses. Um, over the course of the chamber, they've certified probably hundreds of businesses. What does that mean? That means that you are put on a list and it's giving you an opportunity for minority owned businesses to be able to access bigger contracts or contracts with the city of New York. And I'm talking across all agencies and there's plenty of them. What has been the problem? The biggest problem, and I was a consultant prior in my previous life, I was minority owned, sole proprietor, and you know I had it for over 10 years, never received one contract. So I speak from experience and telling you that these contracts are written in such a way that they're not meant for the small mom and pops. The let me jump in. You said you never received one contract, but let me get to the key question. Yes. How many contracts did you fill out? about four that I knew that I semi-qualified for. Okay. And believe it or not, those came from big, bigger corporations, and I'm not gonna get into names, they right. usually are the ones that get these contracts, and then they don't meet the threshold. So the city of New York has any, any construction, we'll go there, any construction or business that you do with the city of New York, 25% of that should be covered by a minority-owned business. That's the threshold. The, the state has a similar numbers. How they're meeting them are huge minority-owned businesses, right? And you're talking businesses that have 20, 30, 40, 100, 200, which is considered small businesses. In reality, back to the point what I said prior to when we were having this discussion earlier, is that that's not the case for the Bronx. The Bronx is micro-businesses who are certified. And that means that their balance sheets and their numbers don't meet the criteria for some of these contracts. So they either have to go under a subcontractor, these mega companies who decide whether or not you want to be, make you a subcontractor under them. Um, or, you know, the city meets its numbers and the state meets its numbers with these massive conglomerates that are minority owned. And so the ratio is very small. We get complaints all the time on, on how to access 
over the course of the last year, the Department of Education has done a, a good job in trying to recruit. Um, but you know, the, the one thing that's not said when you certified is how do you get these contracts when you're little? You know, how do you get this contract if you make under a million dollars? Um, why should you certify? If we're, tell, we're promising you contracts and opportunities, then something's got to give on the other end. We're doing the paperwork, we're setting up the businesses, the micro businesses for success. And there should be a larger amount of businesses, minority owned, women, immigrant. This is what the core of our borough is made of. Um, should have access to it, and they do not. And that's been an uphill battle for us, but one that we're not going to stay quiet on. Yeah, Absolutely. Michael, I I'm coming to you now. Talk to me about Third Avenue Bid. I mean, you guys have a race and equity initiative. Share with us a little bit about your uh, th this new initiative. Sure. Um, so the Race and Equity Initiative uh, started as part of Third Avenue Business Improvement District's strategic planning efforts. Uh, and we do the strategic plan every year and we renew our commitment to various uh, efforts. Uh, so this started last October, but was accelerated with the murder of George Floyd and the civil unrest that's ha been happening throughout the nation. And part of that was, you know, really taking a hard look at Third Avenue Business Improvement District and business improvement districts in general uh, and, and doing a deep dive on you know our relationship with city agencies like NYPD or our, our, our relationship with the, the broader community you know traditionally bid membership is very strict to property owners and small businesses within the bid boundary however you know I think that begs the question is as we re-examine business improvement districts should we also re-examine membership um, you know, when we take a look at Third Avenue bid, we're 100% commercial. We have no residential. We're, we're a solid commercial district, yet roughly 450,000 people walk on our sidewalks every day. Um, so, so I think, you know, examining that, doing a deep dive on the history of the Bronx, the history of business improvement districts, and educating ourselves before we even dare educating other, educate other people is the first step. But then I think there are other, you know, um, tangible things that, that we can do. You know, to Lisa's point, um, just last week, actually, the Board of Directors at Third Avenue Bid increased um, our MWB purchasing requirement in internally. So it's, uh, usually we have a 30% uh, uh, purchasing requirement for MWBEs. Uh, we've increased that now to 60%. Um, with with an advancement of, of trying to get as many local firms as possible. But, you know, to Lisa's point, in addition to mo small and micro businesses not having access to those larger contracts, there's huge insurance barriers for MWBE firms. And that's usually why the big firms get them, because the big firms can have the 15 or 25 million or 35 million dollar insurance policy, but that small startup MWBE doesn't have that access. And when it comes down to it, the insurance costs more than the actual job. Um, so, so there's, you know, that, that benefit and cost analysis that folks have to do. Um, so in addition to, to things like, you know, shifting budgetary items, because I think your budget is your living document, which, which kind of sets up the goals for the organization. We've undergone an equity audit. Uh, we've hired a senior advisor for race and equity internally. Uh, and we're looking to create a, a resident board or a resident council to broaden our reach into the community. And, you know, some of the goals that we're, we're talking through are also goals that are being looked at at a citywide level to see if other bids throughout New York City's network would start adopting some of these, these requirements or guidelines to really help address you know, the issues. And you know, I think you know, race and equity have always been there. I just think we haven't talked about them um, yeah. and we haven't given them the, the spotlight that, that they deserve. And I, I think that that's a problem that, that we all have to collectively work to address. Yeah. You know, Lisa, being the chair of the, uh, of the president of the Bronx Chamber of Commerce, I want to ask you the question about race. How many times does that come up? Is there conversations that, hey, there aren't enough black owned businesses uh, in the borough? Is there a conversation that there aren't enough, you know, of these businesses, given the fact that the borough has this 2 million uh, population, but yet and still, we still don't see reflective in the area of business and we don't you know and the conversations have been had um the conversations have been ongoing over the course of the years and the question becomes why is it is it the lack of understanding what it takes to start up a business is it the financial understanding of what it is to open up a business um 
to your point, the majority of our, not almost the entire borough, is all immigrant minority owned. And so over, we have been trying as a chamber to figure out the reach. I, we, one thing that we have really found during this COVID is that we have not been able collectively, been able, unless you have a bid or merchant association, have a really deep reach into neighborhoods that are ignored or don't have a leadership of sorts to get them and provide the services. So we have gone outside our membership and try to figure out how do we reach these individuals who may not understand the system, who need assistance. And you know, there's so many great ideas and entrepreneurs out there, minority black owned businesses or entrepreneurs that start up a business and then do not have the understanding of the capacity to build off of that business. And what we have found is a lot of businesses start up successfully and within two years they have fallen under and that is more about understanding finances and bank accounts. And that was part of the reason why PPP for a lot of these sole proprietors, entrepreneurs of color um, lost it because their banking systems may not fit the criteria of our federal or state government. Um, and that's what we're here for, right? We want to become that access of education. Um, and the Yankees have reached out to us because they have a whole quarter around them of, of small um, minority businesses who said, we don't know what's going on. We don't understand it. And they have been incredible in partnering with us and providing us with the third largest law firm in the country to assist our businesses, our small businesses, help them out, capacity building, immigration, um, yeah. unemployment, the whole nine yards. That was going to be my question and, and, you know, about capacity building, because many times you, you do have people who have good ideas, great intentions. Yeah. Um, but when we talk about equality and equity, um, capacity building is going to actually help to bring that about. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at businesses and I'm looking at people who are investing money into the communities. And I'm wondering if not more money is needed to really talk about, you know, capacity building. So I'm gonna ask this question too, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, you can answer that. And also I want you to talk about uh, the survey that's out there that's also designed to uh, help others as well. Sure. Right. Yeah, on the, on the capacity side, you know, I, I think that, a lot of businesses start off very strong because they have a great passion for the business, for the idea. Folks know exactly how they want things to look. They know exactly how they want people to feel when they walk in the door. And all of those are major components of a business plan. However, equally, if not more so important, are your legal protections, understanding your lease, understanding your finances, having access to capital if, you don't, if you're not bringing in your own capital. All of those things and those items actually underscore systemic racism that's exist in our, existed in our borough. You have, and you know, this is largely white owners who have had access to money. They've had access to legal resources. They've had access to financing for generations, and they've been able to build on their wealth our communities and our, our people of color have not had that access, whether it's due to systemic racism, due to redlining, et cetera, they have not had that access. So they have not been able to build generational wealth or capacity. So I think in order to get really to the root of it, we've got to go there and you know, say, yes, ideas are great. You know, having a passion for your business is great, but how do we ensure that our communities of color have the capacity and the access to those resources. And I think that's where the chamber and, and business improvement districts become very important. As you, for example, Third Avenue bid with the Bronx Community Relief Effort, we're doing a small business uh, relief grant of up to $25,000 for, for business owners. And that's going to eventually pivot to an entrepreneurial uh, startup program over the next few months. You know, Lisa and her team have been doing a tremendous amount of capacity building and training across the spectrum. And uh, I believe Lisa has a survey that was just recently released that, that's really doing a deep dive on, on what business needs are. So Lisa, I don't know if you want to chat about that for a minute. Absolutely want to chat about it because we have really been pushing hard on this survey. You can find it on BronxMeansBusiness.org. Call us. It is on there. And the reason why this is so important is because of the inequities for our borough. It started when the city released funding and the borough only received 1% to 3%. That started the outcry of inequity. And when we realized the amount of PPP not being released into our borough, again, it's 
it's our borough who has always been hit hard. So what we've done with this survey is really about providing resources. And I'm, and I'm asking every business out there to fill it out because what it brings to the attention and fill it out completely. Did you apply? Did you not get the money? Who was there to assist you? Are you minority owned? Have you reached out? What type of resources are there? What type of insurance? It goes, take 10 minutes. But what happens is after we, re we get all that information, we've got hard data to take to our elected official, city, state, federal, and make them aware of what our borough needs collectively. And try to do that fair share. Try to figure out what is it that our borough is so different than any other borough that we're always left behind. And it's time to put a stop to that. And this is a perfect opportunity to do that. Well, unfortunately, we have to put a stop to this interview. Great information, great conversation. Thank you. We're going to continue to monitor this. And as you continue to get new developments, please let us know uh, that we might be able to also uh, share your voice and also uh, let our residents know exactly what is going on in a very, very, very uh, important matter that's affecting so many people. Thank you so much, Lisa and Michael, for being with us. Thank you for having us. It's great. Appreciate All right. it. All right. Well, Listen, we got to end it with Lisa and Michael, but we're not ending the show. We still have more to come. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break. And we've got more coming up right after this. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at bronxnet.tv. Learn, engage, inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> and welcome back to the show. Darren Jaime here with you. Well, for years, communities of color have been victims when it comes to policing policies that's created a tension between community as well as police. The recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, countless others have actually put pressure on lawmakers to be proactive about creating solutions as well as making a difference. Our next guest is a state senator who's been pushing for various legislation aimed at helping to eliminate police brutality within New York City and the African-American community as well as New York State. Here to provide his point of view on the matter, I'm pleased to be joined by Senator Kevin Parker of District 21. And Senator Parker, good to have you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, great to have you in a good time to have this conversation. Look, um, I'll start off. I mean, everybody's been talking about the repeal of 50A um, and as some form of you know, a, a measure of hope in terms of dealing with police reform. Let me start there and ask you your thoughts about, you know, 50A and having that repealed and having that signed into law by uh, Governor Cuomo and what that actually means. Yeah. Well, first, let me just uh, thank uh, the protesters, and, and because really the protesters have created an environment in which this legislation um, could get passed. Uh, we passed in the state legislature a package of bills, about 10 bills, um, you know, many of which, four of them were mine. There were two others uh, that were passed that I, I originally wrote the, the original uh, legislation on. So, you know, the, the 58 that we passed um, was authored by uh, Senator Jamal Bailey right there in the Bronx. And he's the chairman of the Codes Committee, doing a wonderful job. And that bill actually, um, you know, repeals a law that um, shielded police officers from their conduct rec records being exposed during trial. And that's part of why uh, you couldn't get a uh, prosecution of, of Officer Pantaleo in, in Staten Island and many other officers, right? And so the repeal of that um, is a good first step in terms of transparency that we need uh, in order to to create the kind of accountability that that we uh, are hearing that the communities want, and when we talk about what the community wants, obviously the community wants transparency. The community wants to be treated with equality and equity. And I know that you put legislation forward trying to deal in just in just that manner. Walk us through a little bit about your legislation. Well, I put put something forth. I mean, we've done like I said a number of bills. Um, already, I don't think I think that was again the, the the kind of easy stuff. I think there's a lot of more important things to to do. Um, and then as you hear the chance in the streets about um, defunding police, we understand that's not just about taking away, you know, not eliminating the police force and, and, and not just taking away money from the police force, but really out reallocating those funds to things that we don't need police um, officers for. And so I've drafted a bill um, that I'm referring to as the fourth response. 
which is a non-police response to mental health and substance abuse calls, right? So currently, um, when you call 911, there's three responses, right? There is a, you know, a fire emergency response, there's a medical emergency response, and a police criminal justice response. Unfortunately, the police criminal justice response is the default response. And so, you know, if, if you have a person who's having a mental health crisis, you call 911, the police show up, um, they're not properly trained. And so when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And then the police hammer everything. And so you wind up with people who are, you know, busted, broken, you know, arrested, and oftentimes killed. Um, and so we're hoping that this legislation will be able to get passed um, to provide another way for us to deal with those kind of responses. And I think that those uh, are, are kind of the way that we're, we've been moving. I also have been working on a piece of legislation um, called Qualified Immunity. Um, again, this is another piece of legislation that Jamal Bailey has been involved with, and Senator Zelma Myrie has also been involved in, in terms of uh, essentially stopping um, the cover that police have um, from, from personal liability. So currently, um, because of qualified immunity, if an officer does something improper, you, there's, there's no uh, personal recourse that you can take in terms of like a lawsuit or something like that. Qualified immunity, um, you know, uh, my bill re repeal that is based on the Colorado law um, that was just uh, recently signed. Uh, and then we think that's a, a, another good step. Um, I also have a bill on excessive use of force. And this bill is actually based on the California law that was passed last year. Right now, when we talk about you know, um, use of force, it really is really subjective, right? It's a, it's a, it's a term of art because mm. there's really nothing in the law that tells you what excessive use of force is. I have a bill that now defines excessive use of force in the context of state law and I think is uh, you know, going to be a good step towards us um, holding police officers accountable um, for their behavior. Uh, and then we also have um, a couple of other bills, uh, one on, on residency, um, requiring uh, police officers in New York City to be, to be residents of the city, um, as well as uh, a bill that requires them to have um, liability insurance. Uh, again, we're looking, we really want to make sure there's some personal responsibility with, with police officers who are representing our community. And we really need to um, you know, pass some legislation that creates not just additional transparency and accountability, um, but responsibility by these officers. Yeah. Responsibility is key. And I think a lot of people are calling for responsibility and accountability in a time, you know, in a time such as this. Talk to me about what you're hearing about police community relations right now, because obviously uh, the protests have died down somewhat, uh, but yet and still the relationships are still questionable. Yes, those police community relationships are strained, uh, you know, and so, you know, we're, you know, we're continuing to, to work on them. But the reality is, you know, we know that all police officers aren't bad. We know we need the police. We know that there's a lot of good police out there doing good things in our community. Um, the problem is that the police, you know, the, the good police have shown and demonstrated that they are unable and unwilling to police their own ranks. And so it's really now time for the state legislature and the city council and other bodies to come in and, again, create that kind of accountability, responsibility, um, and transparency that that the protesters are asking for. And so, you know, I, I expect that that relationships will increase over time. I think that all of us are dependent on each other. Um, you know, we need the police, but the police also need us um, to do their jobs as well. And so um, we're hoping that over time that th those conversations will get better. Another thing that I'm actually working on with uh, Borough President Eric Adams is a call on uh, our communities, Black, Latino, and Asian communities, to get more of our young people involved in, in police work. You know, part of the problem is that we've actually signed up to allow a kind of a, a, a invading force outside of our community to police us. It, it really doesn't make any sense. These are good paying jobs, full time with a living wage with benefits, and we really should be steering more of our own uh, young people into those, those careers. And, and then simultaneously, hopefully develop a cadre of police officers who are in tune with our community, connected to our community, and will police us in a more humane and dignified fashion. You want police that are going to be definitely reflective of the community. I think that's, that's it. So they would know how to respond uh, to certain calls. Uh, let me talk about certain calls that we're hearing now, the quote-unquote Karen calls, where, you know, calls are being made on Blacks for anything, from Starbucks to just uh, Walmart to be having a room at your own hotel. Um, these calls that are 911 calls that some people honestly feel 
Okay, well, what's the problem with being called, uh, with the police being called? But when you're in the African-American community and you're in a minority, um, you realize that one wrong call, you don't get the ability to go home. The problem of weaponization of the, of the 911 emergency system has been going on for a number of years. It's not a new, a new conversation, right? And Karens or the backyard Beckys or whatever we want to call them, um, you know, have been rampant and really have caused a lot of, um, you know, strife and anguish, uh, you know, in the black community in particular. Uh, and so actually, I, one of the bills that I passed in that package of bills is a bill on, on false 911 reporting that creates a private right of action, which means that a individual, like again, if you go to the Amy Cooper, Christian Cooper uh, scenario in Central Park, my bill, not that it is law, allows Christian Cooper to actually sue Amy Cooper um, for her actions. And so um, we believe that that's important. But then also, um, I'm not sure if you saw it today, but Cy Vance has actually um, filed criminal charges against Amy Cooper. And, you know, hopefully that will open up, um, you know, the notion for other DAs to do the same when we're coming across these, these issues. Yeah. Where do we see things going forward from here? I mean, obviously the protests are still taking place across the street. I mean, across, across the country, I should say across the street, across this, across the country, people are really still vocal about the need for reform. Um, and when we talk about criminal justice reform, you know, there's plenty of places that we can find that still needs work. So what do we see happening from here? Well, again, I think that, you know, I want to thank the protesters. I want them to, you know, keep that same energy as they go forward through the summer. Um, and then at the same time, I think that the state legislature is looking at, you know, going into session again, you know, maybe once or twice more. And I'm really hoping that we take up some more um, police reform legislation. There's a lot of ideas that are, that are coming forward, um, not just by me, but by, by a lot of my colleagues. Um, a number of us have put in bills um, that require police officers when they're on duty to um, report, you know, uh, excessive use of force, right? And so, um, you know, forget the cop that was kneeling on the neck of, of George Floyd, the bills that we are putting in will require the officers that witnessed that to either intervene or to report the behavior, um, you know, and, and to make sure that um, there is a, actually an incentive um, and not really more of an incentive, more, more just a duty for those officers to stand up for justice and not just um, you know, protect the back of, 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 of their partner, even if they may be doing something um, wrong, and illegal, right? So that's another um, idea that, that people are, are coming up with. Um, and then, um, you know, and, and, and then, you know, there's other legislation, you know, another idea, I actually got this from Eric Adams. He's talked a lot about the fact that precinct commanders are the most important people in, um, in the police department. Right. And he says that we really need to have more community input in the decision making of who those um, commanders of those precincts are. And so I have a bill that's essentially creating an advisory board to help choose those police, those police commanders um, so that the community can actually be involved in, in, the, uh, in the, the, uh, the hiring and selection um, of those commanders. And again, I think there's gonna take multiple steps. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of legislation uh, and I think that we're getting there. Um, but certainly, I think we can certainly also use a lot more coordination between elected officials and those protesters and develop some dialogues so, so we can, you know, kind of chop it up about, you know, what they're thinking, what we're thinking, what the possibilities are within the context of the law. Um, right now, a lot of us are using our imaginations and um, not necessarily always uh, in sync with what, what people are thinking on the streets. And so we'd love to see, again, more of that dialogue, more of that conversation um, about about how we do it you know saying you know it's cute to say defund the police but what does that mean um in reality and i think in some cases i do know it means you know more money for some youth employment more money for after school right more money for uh you know gang divergence programs right um you know things like again my fourth response bill but you know you know there's probably a lot of other important ideas out there and we need to have some conversations um, about about how we about how we do that. Yeah, uh, what people are doing during these times are recording police, and uh, we see more and more video. We would, we would not be talking about George Floyd if it wasn't for video. We wouldn't be talking about Eric Garner if it wasn't for video. And so, uh, give us a little bit about your thoughts and legislation concerning recording police activity. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been an important issue once 
you know, in the, in the, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, um, there was a lot of police officers knocking the phones out of the hands of bystanders. Um, there's a bill that was actually drafted by somebody, Nick Perry. I was the Senate sponsor of that bill. We passed it into law when we passed that, that package of 10. And it's, we call it the right to record bill. And it affirms the right for people to record the, the activities of, 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 of police uh, making arrest. Um, and so um, we think that's really, really important. Obviously, that's been part of the transparency we've seen. And we want to make sure that that, that continues to happen because uh, oftentimes that's the only thing standing in you know, in between justice. You know, frankly, had that, that young lady who was very, very brave uh, in, that, in that moment not recorded what was happening um, for that almost 10 minutes of the murder of George Floyd, we may have never known what really happened there. And so we really wanna, uh, you know, continue to encourage people um, to watch the watchers. And, and, um, and again, you know, we wanna let folks know uh, that we're doing an important, uh, an important thing by affirming their rights and, and making sure they understand them being um, citizens know they're protected when they're doing doing what they're what they're doing in terms of recording police. And as an elected official, of course, I know you get both sides. You get the community, and then you also get police. So, what are you hearing on the part of uh, police and law enforcement uh, when it comes to the reform? When it comes to what's going on right now, um, and and pretty much w w the temperature. The, the vast majority of the police I've talked to. Um, obviously are not happy about the protests per se, um, but they are, they do understand um, much of what's going on. They see what's happening, right? And especially the officers of color that I speak to, um, many of them are, are surprised that it's taken this long um, for this to happen. And many of them have felt powerless, to be honest with you, uh, you know, in the context of, you know, of their jobs and some of the things they've seen and not feel like they've been able to, to respond to it. Um, but, for, you know, but for the most part, uh, you know, they, you know, they, they look at it, you know, look, if you're a good cop, this, these changes don't, don't affect you. Right. right. Because you're doing the right thing. And so none of this stuff is going to be something that, 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 um, that bothers you. It really is about people who are not doing the right thing. And we're really hoping that this actually creates a disincentive for police officers, uh, you know, to act badly. Um, you know, and so, you know, much of, and, and, in, and in some cases, they've actually worked with us on the reform. So, for instance, um, I passed a bill that requires state police to have body cameras. We actually worked with the state troopers and their, and their police union in order to do that, um, to make sure that our, our, um, our bill didn't interfere with their work rules. Um, but they did not oppose the notion of body cameras. And so, um, starting next April, you're going to see state troopers, um, park, New York State Parks Police, um, Department of Conservation Police, all wearing body cameras, right? And, um, and again, that, that, is, that is something that they came forward and said, yes, we wanna work with you. And that was something that we were working on way before the protests. Uh, and so, um, you know, hopefully on many of the things that we're going forward with, we'll get more input with, from police departments and, and um, you know, and, and they will, you know, be honest and upfront um, about, about how they feel and it will get, uh, get to a place where we are all agreeing um, because change is going to happen. So the question is, you know, is, is the change going to happen with you or without you? Yeah, yeah. And so where do you see things going from here? we got about a minute left, but uh, what do we see? What can we forecast for the near future? Well, um, I, look, I think that unless we do something, you know, significant with our young people, we're going to be in for a long, hot summer. There's been a number of shootings. There's a lot of gang activity happening. Um, and I think this, the, the vast majority of it is going to fall on the people in the community to address the issues in our community. Um, without the police. And so that's going to be our first test. People say they want to, you know, address things without the police. Here we go. And so let, let's, let's really start looking at what's happening with these shootings. Let's start in addressing the young people in our community. Let's figure out why these things are happening. And, um, you know, let's, let's, let's get our, our boots on the ground um, as it relates to that. Uh, and I think the state legislature still has, again, more work to do. I'm going to be encouraging uh, us in our next, you know, legislative session to bring up more um, police reforms and, and really start addressing some of the deeper needs uh, that we have in our community around um, police community relations. Wow. And, Senator and, Parker, we got to leave it there. Okay. Um, but I do want to thank you for coming and sharing with us here. And listen, a lot of great work that's going on. And it's certainly as we talk about, it's going to be a long summer. So hopefully you can stop back and check with us and uh, let us know how things are going and uh, what the community needs to know. Absolutely. Be safe. All right, Senator Parker, our guest here. Listen, we are taking a quick break. We do have more shows. Stay with us. We're coming right back 
in a few. Right now, the Bronx is facing dueling crises, COVID-19 and measures against extreme police violence. Both crises have wreaked havoc, particularly on Black and Latino communities, and Planned Parenthood of Greater New York Action Fund is facing the challenges by head on. They're dealing with the barriers to healthcare and advocating for systematic changes within the police and healthcare systems. And the organization advocates for policies and legislation's impact in the community. And joining us now to share further insight is the Director for Community Organizing at PPGNY Action Fund, Ms. Leanne Ritz. And uh, Leanne, good to have you. Hey, thank you for having me. So excited to be here. Great. I'm glad to have you. And as I said in the lead in, um, when we talk about the times, obviously, uh, for those in communities of color, it's a rough series, season right now. And trying to navigate, you know, trying to navigate between COVID-19, trying to navigate between uh, the, the civil unrest that's out there and the social unrest that's out there. But talk to us because uh, Planned Parenthood, of course, has definitely got some legislation and some policies that they're putting forward as well. No, absolutely. Um, so, you know, as part of Planned Parenthood of Greater New York Action Fund, our top priorities as the as the uh, advocacy arm of the organization, our top priorities right now are really just around making sure that we protect um, the reproductive rights and um, access, reproductive justice access to all the health care we provide and continue to, pro to protect those um, rights, right? Mm -hmm. So how we do that is really just advocating on various levels of government and also advocating in community spaces and making sure that we are always a part of the conversation um, because reproductive rights and, and, and reproductive justice is ultimately a human rights issue. So when we talk about human rights, there's, there's no way that Planned Parenthood couldn't be part of that conversation. Um, and so we are fighting for you know all the marginalized communities and that includes Black and Latinx communities, of course, that includes LGBTQ plus uh, communities um, and, you know, Im um, immigrant communities and all the other communities that are, are hit very hard um, during this time and, and always, really. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things about being a community that's well hit, I mean, hit hard, when we talk about the community being hit hard, one of the areas where I know that we're particularly hit hard is right now COVID-19. We're talking about yeah. these healthcare disparities. And I know that you guys have been very vocal about dealing with the healthcare disparities. So walk us through a little bit about what, you're, what, you're, what you want to see and what you really want to have addressed. You know, so when it comes to COVID-19 in particular, right, like the way in which um, our communities, and when I say our communities, I'm talking about communities of color, I'm talking about more specifically Black and Latinx communities have been hit is crazy and part of the reason why it's so crazy is because 70 percent of the the deemed essential workers um are from those communities um and because they do not have um the time to uh, quarantine because they're working as essential workers um ultimately those families have been hit the hardest um and then of course you know, as Planned Parenthood being an organization, and, and I, would, I would like to say a staple in the community as a provider that gives care no matter what, which is our tagline, and we stay true and hold true to that tagline, um, regardless of insurance, immigration status, um, economic status, ability to pay, we are going to serve our community. Um, and so we make sure that those are priorities for us. So anything plaguing those communities, it's plaguing us. That's our business, right? Because we cannot, when it comes to police brutality, when it comes to COVID-19, although people might not see that as a reproductive, sexual reproductive health issue, it is. Because it is, it is 
it is part of is a burden to the communities we serve. So anything that is a burden to the communities we serve and is an obstacle for them accessing health care and more specifically reproductive health care, um, we are going to be on the front lines fighting with them. But, but you know, and I know that, you know, to the average person, commonly, um, when you say that, that doesn't really ring true, right? I mean, people think like, okay, well, we think Planned Parenthood, we're thinking about reproductive, uh, the, the topic of abortion comes up. But then when you talk about <laughs> immigrant issues. Um, somebody's going to say Planned Parenthood, immigrant issues. These things simply just don't line up. But you say what? Well, I say absolutely it does. And if you really think about it, uh, when it comes to, so let's just use your example. You said right. immigrant issues. So let's just talk about the recent SCOTUS decision that just um, happened, was just decided that the, that schools and employees, employers actually have a say-so on the on your reproductive justice i mean reproductive health access um based off of religion religion and how could that be true how could uh where you go to school and where you work how could that impact and why should they have any any business in your reproductive health but the point is is that they're all connected and that's the bigger picture and when i started off talking to you darian you know i talked about human rights so that is really the, the, the umbrella under which we all operate. And when I say we all, I mean all nonprofits, all community serving organizations such as us. So we have to hold true to that. Every single issue that comes out of these communities are our issues. And I'm very clear about that. And when we talk about being very clear about it, I want to be very clear about the budget because, of, of course, we talk about the budget and the money coming to the community. And people are very clear. We talk about defunding police, reallocating resources. And for you, there is something called budget justice. Yes. So, you know, ultimately, defunding the police is one of those uh, um, themed uh, policy uh, movements out there of, among many that um, has gotten a lot of steam due to, you know, the, you know, all of the uprisings that have been happening. And, um, and that's valid. But I think we as Planned Parenthood of Greater New York understand that it's important to break things down so that the community truly understands what it is that we're fighting for. And there's no gray lines, there's no gray area. Mm -hmm. um, and so we choose to, um, to call it budget justice because that's exactly what it is. We need to look at the budget um, with a lens of equity, um, and in our minds, health equity, um, and use that lens to allocate funds in the way that is equitable, where it's needed, where it will actually um, invest in community. Um, and so we believe in budget justice because budget justice is the way forward. Um, and, and that is how we are going to be calling it uh, as we see it, budget justice. Yeah, yeah. Let me bring it a little bit closer to home. When we talk about uh, COVID-19, obviously COVID-19 having a real uh, effect right here in our borough. And when we talk about Bronxites uh, who struggled during these times, how did you guys, uh, were, how were you able to su 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 provide support services and at the same time navigate right here in our borough uh, for people who are really dealing in that area? Yeah, for sure. So in, in the Bronx community, I mean, you know, we do have a center um, on 149th and Grand Concourse that, uh, you know, is well known and most people know about our center. And even during COVID-19, we have been very, very, very steadfast in making sure that we remain open, we remain um, accessible, and, um, and we, we, we want to also uplift the fact that we need to be safe, right, during this period. So we, again, our tagline is care no matter what. Um, and so we are doing that, and we have been doing that by offering telehealth services. Um, and so this is this is a special type of service that folks can access uh, via video conference or call or over the um, computer using um, you know the internet. Um, and then we also have the option of calling in and having over the phone consultations and visits with your providers, as well as in-person um, visits as well for those who um, need those visits. And it is determined by both the provider and by the patient that that's what, they, what is needed. Um, and we also want to make sure that, you know, tele and I also want to uplift that telehealth services seems like a new, a new wave. Most, most of um, our healthcare systems are, are practicing telehealth services at the time. I mean, right now in particular, and 
we want to continue to offer that, but we also want to be clear that, you know, telehealth services aren't perfect. Um, and there are, there can still be barriers in telehealth services, especially with um, communities such as ours, particular, particularly um, the Bronx community, um, and because there's barriers in accessing, you know, having stable internet, for example. We just went through a struggle <laughs> with our internet. But, um, you know, just being able to get that, also just, you know, competency of, around navigating um, apps and things like that and we want to uphold and uplift that and make sure that we're we're tuning into those things and of course language barriers and we want to be able to have those things available so we are doing our part to you know constantly take look take a look at our service to make sure that we are um, being able to offer the most high quality uh health care um you know no matter what um and being able to do it at an affordable and accessible um rate and you know, manner. So that's really what we're doing, and we're continue to do that. Doing yeah. that, I, yeah. And when you talk about healthcare, obviously, let's talk about our borough again, the borough of the Bronx. And for those people who don't know, the Bronx has one of the worst uh, health outcomes in all of the United States, one of the worst in the country. Um, and so when we look at it, we see high rates of asthma, we see diabetes, we see a whole lot of other things uh, where we have now uh, and have for some time had this not uh, number 62 campaign because the, Bro uh, the Bronx is, of course, number 62 when it comes in health outcomes. But from your research and what are you seeing, what is contributing to some of these outcomes that we're seeing that have landed the Bronx at the bottom, uh, particularly in the country when it comes to health care? So I would break it down into two buckets. I would say the first bucket, of course, is you know, systemic racism. <laughs> systemic mm -hmm. racism is, is, you know, I mean, it's something that we've been talking about a lot in the press. So um, people have been hearing a lot about that. But, you know, it, you know in, in our minds as Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, we're very clear that systemic racism and economic inequities are, you know, contributing to the outcome, the, the, the adverse outcome of these health disparities. And you see these wide gaps in um, communities such as the Bronx because access um, is, there's a barrier to access. And that's because of the systemic racism that, in, that exists within large systems such as our healthcare system. Um, and also that contributes to implicit bias um, that is, is experienced by many people in the healthcare system and from their providers and from the system at large. Um, and so when we talk about um, various health outcomes that have huge gaps, and the list is enormous, right? We could talk about um, more specifically like maternal, maternal um, mortality rates, um, and most people have, you know, brought this up, and I'm so happy that this is a point of discussion uh, in a lot of spaces, mm -hmm. um, but we just lost, you know, a young woman in Brooklyn um, on July 3rd, Shy Asia Washington, um, who was getting a cesarean section to have her, to give birth to her beautiful baby. Um, and she lost her life. Um, and people, uh, you know, are by right, you know, upset and, and have uprised because of that. Very similar to, uh, you know, um, Amber Rose Isaac here in the, in the Bronx, not too long ago as well, who was also 26, who lost her life. Um, and so when we look at those numbers, when we look at those incidences um, and those cases and the lives that have been lost that are completely avoidable um, in a system where we don't want to talk about racism, we don't want to talk about the systemic racism, those are all things that contribute to the, the, the very deeply rooted mistrust and distrust within our community in the healthcare system. And those are the things that we need to address, um, you know, as community-based organizations, as healthcare providers, um, and including Planned Parenthood, we're not excluded from that, you know, so we are also um, having those very difficult conversations, but conversations that are frankly necessary and um, are overdue, um, and to make sure that we are repairing and doing the reckoning that we need to, repairing the harms that have been done historically, um, and reckoning with our past. And when we talk about, you know, a call to action, uh, and really dealing with this matter, how do you get the community involved, what is the call to action? What do we do, where do we go from here? Yeah, I love that question. 
Um, there is so much people can do. And I think that people often ask, like, what is it that I can do? And it doesn't always have to look the same, right? It doesn't always have to be a protest or in the street. We do that as well, especially in the advocacy arm and in the action fund. We are always um, rallying, always protesting, always making sure we're standing in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the struggle. But on top of that, I think that there are four tiers in which people can get involved. And, you know, and when I say four tiers, I mean, there's the individual level on the individual level, you know, doing your research, educating yourself, having conversations like this with your neighbors, your friends, your family, right? Um, and making sure that we do the work to unlearn and learn um, some of the things that we have all been, um, you know, wrapped into, you know, just by being in this society. Um, and then also on an organizational level, like Planned Parenthood for Greater New York, um, as for an example, we have a lot of actions coming up. So for example, this week is the week of, of action that we launched, um, which is called Social, Social Media for Social Movement um, Week of Action, where we teamed up with um, the widow of um, Eric Gardner, Esau Gardner, and her team that uh, have, has recently created and developed um, and made a film, a documentary, um, on the trial, on the trial that never happened <laughs> for mm -hmm. Eric Gardner. Um, and so we are helping to screen that film. We have a whole week of action. Today we are kicking off this week of action with a town hall discussion on civic engagement within the Black community and communities of color um, and talking about how important it is to, you know, fill out your census and to register to vote and to get mobilized, get mobilized and get organized and to, and to be involved. Um, and so, you know, those are all things we can do. And of course, you know, on a systemic level, you know, just with your, it really comes down to dollars and cents and like, where do you invest your money? You know, when we talk about, we're talking about defunding the police and, and budget justice, we also should look at ourselves <laughs> with the same equity lens and say, how are we spending our money? Are we supporting small businesses, local businesses, black and brown com um, businesses? Are we, are we doing research behind these, these huge monopolizing, you know, uh, um, you know, retailers out there? Are we doing all of that? And a lot of these things are coming to the surface, you know, on social media and, and other places. People are starting to really understand that um, money talks. So there are, there are several levels in which people can get involved. And we want people to do that. And you can also become a volunteer with Planned Parenthood of Greater New York by going to our website and, get, and click getting involved. And then, you know, and see and get involved with us and, 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 get, and get the work done. <laughs> yeah. Well, Leanne, I want to thank you. Got to leave it there. But some valuable information for our Bronxites and, of course, for residents across New York City. Leanne is our guest here, and she is the Director of Community Organizing, I should say, at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. My problem with the P's, Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. Try saying that four times. But right? thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Well, listen, we all let you know we have come to the end of our show today. We want to thank you for joining us here uh, for the Social Justice Forum. We want to let you know that we can watch every week here on Bronx's Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, that would be Channel 33 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Also, if you want to catch the conversation again, don't forget just to visit us on the website. And if you want to present your point of view, you're always more than welcome to go to any of our social media pages at Bronxnet TV. I am Darren Jaime saying take care, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. You've been watching the Bronx Social Justice Forums. <laughs>